Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, or good day, wherever you happen to be. Um, Rob Sidor, uh, Chief Architect at Red Hat, here with uh, um, Jeremy again. So, Jeremy. Jeremy Davis. And, uh, today, we got um, Jay Howell with us, and he's going to talk about Flight Recorder and Cryostat. So, uh, without further ado, because I think he's the best person to explain it, uh, Jay, take it away. All right, uh, flight recorder. Uh, so uh, we have a lot to cover. Um, here's what I'm gonna cover today. Uh, just an easy Quarkus Rust Easy reactive application. Uh, we're gonna cover command line flight recorder. Uh, we're gonna cover the JCMD, custom events, uh, how to parse custom events, Java mission control, a little bit of visual VM. And uh, then we're gonna move into Cryostat and uh, moving it into Kubernetes. Uh, so what this, session is not. Uh, this session is not how to profile your application. This is how to use the tools on profiling. If you want that, you're going to have to tune in to part two um, when I show you how to use uh, Java Flight Recorder to profile your applications. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, my test app. So this test application is a um, is an application that I downloaded from um, downloaded from Quarkus um, IO, and it's really easy. It's the first one up there, Rust Easy uh, Reactive. Uh, downloaded it as a zip, and uh, let me fire it up. Um, All right, and uh, right now I'm firing this up in the, um, there, let me get to this, uh, firing this up in the developer, and it's up and running. Okay, so this is just a really easy application that um, I fired up. Um, all it really does is it has a Rust endpoint um, that just says, hello from Rust Easy. I have another one in here that I pass an ID into and I've passed my name into it. Hello, Jay from Rust Easy Reactive. So um, this is just a really, really small, easy application that we can play with. Flip back to my slides. All right, so what is Java Flight Recorder? Uh, Java Flight Recorder should always be on. It, it's, it's exactly what it says it is. Um, it's a flight recorder. Now, the question I get is, I have a lot of profile applications. Um, that I'm already using. Can I use this with those? Yes. Um, Flight Recorder should always be turned on and um, it is going to suck up less than 1% of your overhead. It is made to be lean. Um, it's integrated with the JDK. And, and really what this is, this is if, if everything falls apart, your JVM uh, runs out of heat, you're having problems, um, you drop back to the flight recorder, that will tell you what happened. Um, we have a couple different profiles um, in the JDK. Uh, we have uh, two profiles. Um, so what if I told you if it's not documented, it didn't happen? You, you need to turn flight recorder on. Um, JFR is event, driven, is event driven, which means that this is how it can be lean and mean. Um, it it samples events coming out of the JDK, your custom events if you want it, um, and it also samples um, JDK events. Uh, why use Java Flight Recorder? It's based on JVM internals. It's a low overhead, continuous monitoring. Um, it does detailed profiling, low configuration, um, event-based. You have a lot of visualization and JDK tools for it. And, and one of the best things is it's free. Um, it comes out of the box with um, everything from JDK 11 on. Um, JDK 8, we'll go over that. That's a, it's a, if you're running on JDK 8, you probably need to upgrade your JDK, but it does work in JDK 8 with a few more switches. There's several ways to interact with Java Flight Recorder. Uh, one of these is uh, locally at startup. Uh, if you want to pass command line parameters in when you start your Java app up, you can pass that in. Uh, JCMD is a local application that you can use, uh, and it, it interacts via 
um, the PID versus the process ID on your uh, on your system. Java Mission Control interacts through JMX or through your local PID if you're running Java Mission Control on your local box. And then Cryostat. Hey, Jeremy, am I moving too fast? Am I doing okay? No, I think you're doing okay. One thing you might want to drill into too is this is really meant to be run all the time, right? Because profiling tools are kind of notorious for killing your for killing performance, right? That's exactly right. And and this is where we uh, it's a perfect intro to this. The the default configuration. If you um, if you start your JFR continuous recording, like Jeremy said, it should always be on. It, it's a less than a 1% performance hit, and it's, it's meant to always be on in the background. Um, now, if you're doing profiling and say you're looking for a problem, um, you can run with the profile configuration, and that's less than a 2% performance hit. And custom configuration can be a bit dicey, but the aim is that if you have everything turned on in your custom configuration, it's going to be less than a 5% performance hit. Uh, I, I really have never had to use the custom um, other than when configuring some of my custom events. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, this right here is the default configuration. And you will find this in under your JDK. There's a lib directory. And in the lib directory, you will find this JFR file. And this is for JDK 11. And, and really what it defines is each one of the events that it's going to be monitoring. So, so take the one in the middle, Java thread statistics. Um, it's going to be uh, looking at the thread statistics and event and um, emitting an event um, every 1000 milliseconds. So every second um, it's going to be emitting an event for Java thread stats. Um, so, all of these are events um, that are in the JDK. Uh, you can add your own events. We'll look at that a bit later. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to talk about um, down at the very bottom, where we're looking at JDK thread sleep, uh, you'll notice the, the synchronization thre uh, threshold is 20 milliseconds. Um, if you go to, and this is the default configuration, if you go to the profile configuration, you'll notice it's changed to 10 milliseconds. So really what the profile does is uh, the profile configuration is uh, more overhead, but it's meant to take in more events um, and sooner. Now, okay, with events and sampling, I always get this question. Well, I'm going to miss events. You are. Um, you can't grab every single event. If you did, that would be more like uh, some of the profile tools that you're using, and it would be a lot of overhead. So yes, um, you will miss some events, but the idea is that you're going to grab enough events that you'll be able to see what's going on. Um, so this is uh, the normal continuous monitoring for JDK 8. Um, some weird things in here that you don't need after JDK 8 are unlock diagnostic VM options, debug non-safe points, unlock commercial features, Initially, Sun, I'm sorry, uh, Oracle was going to uh, charge for this feature. And this was a commercial feature that was going to be put in the Oracle JDK. And uh, it eventually became just part of the JDK and it was contributed by Oracle back to the Open JDK. So it, it does go back to Sun, though, doesn't it? It does go back to Sun. It sure does. Yes, it's been around. Um, and so this was. This is what you need in JDK 8. Um, and then you have your flight recorder options um, down there. Um, as we move through JDK 11 uh, and 17 and 21, uh, what you found is this has become more um, baked into the JDK. This is not a commercial feature. You don't have to pay for it anymore. It's just part of the JDK. Um, so these are, this is what you would pass in on your command line when you're going to start your Java application. Uh, you might want to give it a delay. Um, you don't want to sample your startup. Your startup is going to populate caches, and it, it's going to throw off your uh, what you're looking at. So you might want to delay until your app starts up. This will run for 10 minutes, and then it will shut down. Um, and the name of this one is going to be default. 
And the settings for this, I told you there's a, a default and a profile. Um, that settings, you can set whether which one it is, default or profile. I could have left it off. It really is default is the default. And then I have the file name. Um, so this Jay, is what, I, I can edit those templates? Yes. Yes, you can. Matter of fact, you can not only edit those templates, but you can copy them and make them your own. Um, and and you can you can change, um, you know, you can add things, you can remove things. So yes, you can run with your own template. And that goes back to the files we saw earlier. Um, you just have to edit that XML and you should be good to go. All right, so for JDK and 11, really this is all you need for continuous monitoring. Um, you pass this in on your command line, um, you, uh, you pass in a file name, start flight recording, and this is what's important, dump on exit equals true. Um, if you don't put dump on exit equals true, um, if you're, say, you end up with um, a, a, an out of memory um, issue, uh, you will not have a flight recording. So uh, dump on exit equals true is important, but this is really all you need for JDK 11 and above. Um, so uh, you can start multiple flight recorders at the same time. And I'm going to flip over and um, I am going to, um, let me go ahead and end this and let me uh, make sure I got everything packaged. And All right, and now I'm going to start two um, as soon as this finishes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start two flight recorders on the same JVM. You know what? That actually may be, you guys might need to see that a little easier. Is that a little better, Jeremy? Rob? There you go. I, I, I can see that fine. So, so basically what I have here is I, I'm starting two flight recorders and, and I'm starting um, the Quarkus application. Okay, and you notice it says starting recording number one uh, using max size as the default. And it tells me uh, use JCMD and this is the PID um, that I have uh, for this Java application just started up. And just so you know, it started up. Um, localhost 8080. Yep. And yep, there we go. So we are started. And now what I can do is um, I can flip over. Um, but let me go ahead and advertise JCMD for a second. If you've never used JCMD, uh, JCMD has a lot of uses. It is, um, it's a, it, it should be your Swiss army knife um, in Java. It allows you to um, to print threads. It allows you to get heat dump and heat information. It allows you to run your GC. If you want to do a heat dump, it allows you to do a heat dump. This tool only works locally. And one of the neat things that I like about it, and let me flip back over, is when I run JCMD, it gives me. So here's one. Uh, here's my my Quarkus application. It gives me all of the, there we go. It gives me all the PIDs. Um, I will tell you one of the things that I have a hard time with is if I'm running in a container inside Kubernetes and I open up a terminal, like my PS is gone. I can do, I can look at slash proc. There's a, there's a couple things that you can do that are really kind of weird. Um, but if you have a JDK installed, um, you can run JCMD and it will give you all of the PIDs um, for each one of the Java applications. And this is the one that we're going to be looking at right here, which is my uh, my Quarkus application. Um, I will go ahead and and start to do some JCMD. Um, so I can do JCMD, a Java flight recorder, and and I can I can do uh, oh forgot my PID. Uh, this is my PID. Oops. 
Okay. And what the JCMD JFR check does, it tells me that I have two recordings that are running. Um, and if, um, if, if I wanted, so I can tell you that I have um, both the continuous and the profile are running at the same time. And if I want to, um, what I can do is I can, I can do the, I can do a JFR dump and I can, um, so, uh, so now I have, um, I'm doing the JFR dump command, um, and I'm dumping the profiler and, and I'm going to dump it into my recordings directory. Uh, so, so now I have it in my recordings directory and And there is my custom dump right here. So, uh, so what you can do is you can you can actually you can start um, you can start it as well. If I wanted to start a new one, um, what I could say is I could I could come back up here. And say JFR start settings equal profile delay equals 10 milliseconds duration equals 10 i'll call it another profiler and i'll say re uh, recording new recording so now if i come back up here and i check you see that i have another profiler um and it is delayed right now because it's uh it's still in its it's still in its 10 second delay should be running now. So that is, um, that's how you use JCMD. Um, and let me flip back over to, um, so I've got all that stuff here in my in the presentation. Um, you can see that uh, I just copied this out, paste this in, um, and uh, JCMD works. Um, any questions so far? Right on. Doesn't, yeah, we're good to go. No questions so far. All right. So the next thing I'm going to go over is this is really useful is creating an event, um, creating a stock event um, in uh, in your Java application that is that you're going to be able to see in, uh, in in any of these tools. Now, has anybody ever done the start millies, finish millies, trying to profile a function in Java? I, I'm sure everybody's done it somewhere. And you're you're spitting out all this stuff in your logs. Um, it's a real pain. Uh, what this does is this will take the place of all of that. Uh, there is method profiling, and it does method sampling inside of the Java Flight Recorder. But maybe you have uh, you have a REST call that's taking a long time. Um, you want to pass things in. Um, you want to be able to see what's going on. You want to be able to do some debugging with it. It's typically been a problem. Um, you can create an event. And that's really what this looks like, is you just extend JFR event, um, and you put, I, I've got these three variables in here, uh, path, key, and result, that we are going to um, fill out. Um, so, um, I'm going to flip back over and show you what that uh, show you what that looks like. If I can grab it, um, there we go. Sorry about that. So this is my greeting resource uh, right here. This is what was created. Uh, this is the hello method, and. Um, if you notice that I have instantiated a REST call event, um, and then I've said begin and commit. I haven't really done a lot with it. And like, like I said, this is what the REST call event looks like. So, so you, you, you added an actual, can you go back to that other code for a minute? So you added yep. a, a, a memory leak thread? Um, oh, further down, yes. Yes. Oh, because I saw it at the variable at the top. So, I mean, I can do yeah. that without had it, having to add anything special. So that's uh, um, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. So well, you did that wanted, so you could catch it. Is yeah. What so what doing? I wanted to do was um, I I do have I have a memory leak thread that will that will create um, a memory leak, and it will um, 
and and the reason I put it as a static was so that I could I could get a hold of it and stop it on another method, right? But but pretty much um, I wanted to do this um, so you can see the memory leaking inside of the Java flight recorder. So yeah, I I didn't I didn't realize how alarming that might be. It's like oh mem memory leak. <laughs> No, I mean, I, 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 I can create memory leaks without having to add anything special. So um, nice. it's just interesting. It's uh, cool that you added that so you could observe what it actually looks like. Yeah, what, what I wanted to do was I, I wanted to add this so I could start and stop the memory leak. Um, because I, you know, eventually when, the when, when I end up with an out of memory error, the everything becomes flight recorder and everything. Um, flight recorder will print out, but anything that I'm looking at from a JMX concept uh, kind of goes belly up at that point, right? But flight recorder will continue after you had an out of memory error. It will finish up and it will, it may not log things exactly correctly um, after the mem after it hit the out of memory error, but it will finish up the file. Um, and as it exits, um, it will, uh, it will finish writing the file. You're not going to end up with an open file. So, uh, so yeah, so I did a begin um, and in the commit, um, let me go ahead and look at some of this. I, I put in, this is a hello delay. Um, I, I basically waited uh, five seconds and I, I can't really wait much longer than this because I am using a rest easy reactive. Uh, reactive will uh, kill any blocking threads um, that it sees as blocking. So uh, I have to be careful with this or else rest easy reactive will kill it. So. Um, so I go ahead and, and wait five seconds here. I just want to be able to make sure that I can see it. Um, and then this is the one that takes an argument. This is where I add the key, the path, and the result so we can see it logged. So I've got three different methods um, that we're going to be um, that we're going to be looking at. Um, let me go ahead since I still already have. Uh, since I let me make sure I have it. Yep. So that's still running. Um, let me go ahead and hit a couple of those methods um, that are up there. Um, so I hit the hello. Um, there's me. Let me say Rob. And uh, let me hit Jeremy. Um, and then let me do the um, uh, let me do the hello delay. So you'll see it takes a, a good five seconds to roll through um, and it'll eventually come through. So, um, all right. So uh, what we can do now is um, I can uh, now look at those events. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, I'm going to launch. Uh, let me first of all, let me catch up with my slide presentation. Um, all right, um, so adding custom events. Um, so one more thing with custom events that I have not gotten down here, you can add a periodic event. And the way you add a periodic event is you call flight recorder, um, and it's a static method for add periodic event, and you pass in a runnable um, with a class. This is actually, in this function is being called inside of um, a uh, inside of a cache class. So I just wanted you to know, I'm not going to demo this today, but I wanted you to know that you can also control periodic events um, if you do have a cache and you want to see what the cache size is. Or if you have, um, if you want to see, take periodic um, uh, DB connections, like, you know, how much are my DB connections? Um, so if you want to do any of that, uh, you can add periodic uh, events. It's a, it's a, it's a little more detailed, um, and, but it's just basically passing in a runnable to collect events. So, that, so what, is, that what kind are some of like different, like what are some specific use cases? Like where would you, how would you determine which one you would want to do when? Um, so, so I, I would, I would want to, if I have anything like um, everybody has those, uh, those pieces of code that are written by that guy, right? You don't want to be that guy. Right. And um, and so if you have it's a it's a nasty bunch of code, it's complex and nobody wants to really mess with it. Right. I, I would probably 
um, you know, make sure that I had uh, JFR um, uh, begin to commit on like either side of that to measure the performance, especially if it's if it's just a nasty, nasty, nasty piece of code. Um, for for um, your periodic events, I would go through and and I would look at anything that's holding resources, and and I would do this for pools. I would do this for um, any resources that that you think are going to become constrained, even if you don't think they're going to become constrained. It's really nice when everything falls apart and you're searching for that reason why. Everything is going to be a good clue for what fell apart. Um, I will say we had a. Um, so what are you typing a, like, Jay? Connection pools? Is that connection what you meant? Pools, object pools. Um, I. So any kind of any kind of pooling mechanism you're going to do, I, I mean, I would even recommend you know if you're if you're looking at this, you can even add it to EJBs if you're in JEE, right? And and you want a certain amount of pools, you can add it to just about anything that you can get access to. And and so I, I do think that it's it's something that uh, you want to go through and add. I, I want to give a shout out. There should be somebody on your team who is is at least doing performance monitoring and looking at performance. Those are the people in your code review that, you know, are are making sure that everything's running properly. And that person should be adding these events in there. Um, and and I'm going to say that you, you probably don't need to add it to every single method, um, but as many methods as you can add it to is great. Um, because like I said, when things fall apart, everything's going to be a breadcrumb trail back to why things fell apart. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to um, flip back over here and I'm going to hit my first tool. I'll make sure I'm up on my. Okay, so one last thing before we go into tooling. Um, uh, JFR is a utility that can help you that can help you pull. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to um, execute this um, this rest easy. Hopefully that I do a dump with my custom dump. Let me look to make sure my custom dump. Yes, I did. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and execute. And what this is going to spit out is um, this is going to spit out. So right here, I have a uh, rest call event. Um, and, and really what I did was, if you look on the command line, JFR print, I got the event. You can do this for any event that you want to look at um, for any dump. And, and what I've done is I've, I've pushed this out right here. Um, this is the rest call event. You can see I don't, this is the hello. Um, uh, you can tell because it's exec executing the hello method. Um, it doesn't have a path, doesn't have a key, doesn't have a result. You can tell what thread it is, when it started, and what the duration is. So um, this is important. If you want to dump things to JSON and then parse them out later, uh, this is a really important method. Um, to do that. I, I find that very few folks know about JFR, uh, the JFR print stuff, um, and, and it's really useful. Um, so when you do it, um, you can uh, you can spit things out and you can parse them with some other parser. Uh, I'll make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself here. Um, Wait, what, are, what are some other parsers like that you might, might look at using? Uh, so uh, some of the other parsers, a visual VM, um, we'll we'll parse that out, and and so we'll, um, and and so will Java Mission Control, um, and we'll go through and we'll look at those. Uh, I do get a lot of folks that poke me about logging, um, and they they say, well, well, why not use logging, right? And so logging is going to take up a lot of space. Uh, this is low overhead. You can set thresholds um, if you only want to. Uh, if you want to set a threshold for a value, say you're reading a value into your event and you say, well, look, I only want this value to be uh, five or more, right? I only want to log my uh, my cache uh, when I get down to three instances in my cache, right? And and I'm, I'm going to have to do something. Uh, so you can set thresholds. 
This also has concurrent session management. You can have multiple uh, flight recorders running at the same time. And this is a question that I that um, I think I got uh, the last time I did this session was, um, if I have 1% overhead for the default, and I have 2% overhead for the profiling, and uh, let's say I've set up a custom one and it's at 5%, are they all additive? And they aren't. And the reason I say that is um, you're going to have a little bit of overhead, but it's going to be whatever your top one is. Say if you're doing the profiling and the default together, um, it's going to be a max of 2% because it really is, it's, a, it's emitting the events. And the same, most of the same events are going to be emitted for the default that are already being emitted for the profile. The profile is just adding a few more events, right? So you are not going to incur a the more jfrs that you add you will incur a little bit for the file io but for the most part you're not going to incur a large overhead for adding extra flight recorders does that make sense so i i'm under the impression that there's a jmx agent and and a cryostat agent yes okay is that matter when because you brought up um using J console and some of the other stuff. Yes. So um, let me go ahead and hit, um, let me go ahead and hit Java mission control. And okay. yeah, let me, let me hit that first and that'll answer some of those questions. Okay. Uh, so Java mission control, this is free. Um, Sun did contribute it and you'll see it come up. Um, this is the latest version 8.3. Um, I still have, uh, applications that are running, and it would help if I put this in the right window. Um, so um, this comes up, and if I want to go into um, get rid of this, um, so right now this is actually looking on my system, and it tells me that I have uh, Quarkus running, um, and it it basically does what JCMD does: is it looks for the PIDs um, on the local machine. Now, right now, I don't have. Um, I do have. Uh, three, two flight recorders running, um, and I do not have uh, an MBean server running. The cool part is, if you're locally on the console, um, you can start the JMX console um, without having to add command line parameters. Um, and you can see here's the JMX console, uh, current JVM heap usage, um, and you can also get down into your MBean browser. Um, and you can start to look at all the MBeans that you have um, in there. Um, you can also, um, if it, uh, so, let me um, let me kill that. Um, let me go ahead and um, I'm going to dump this whole recording. Might take a second. All right. So uh, this I dump the whole recording, and it makes a temporary file. And this is what comes up. Um, this It's a really great dashboard that comes up. And you'll see things. Right now, I have everything that is in green. Uncheck this. Um, and I have 76 thrown errors. Um, let me. In OK. Cannot increase the font on that. Can you guys see that OK? It's kind of hard to see. It's kind of hard to see. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, that's all right. No, yeah, okay. So, so basically, what this will tell you is it says there's 61 errors per minute. Um, and the largest, the amount of the largest amount of errors is no such method error. Um, this also gives me a warning that I have competing CPU ratio usage. And, and basically, it, it tells me that it was caused by other processes running. So, this gives you really great feedback. Um, like I said, everything else on here, um, if you have GC issues, you're going to see uh, red on the GC. And um, you can look down through, um, you can look down through, here's all the threads that are running. Um, here is the event browser. Um, this is every single event that has been emitted and recording recorded during this flight um, recorder. Man, let's see. So uh, what I can do is I can search for my rest of it, and I can see that there are um, there. These are the ones that have been executed. You can tell 
uh, my labels key passed in URL path output. And you can see that J, Rob, and Jeremy got passed in for a key. Here were the URL and here were the output. This is the custom fields from my event. So um, that's that's um, so if you want to monitor your events, um, you do you have to come down to the event browser and you have to look at your own events or you have to parse them out like we did earlier. So if I wanted a custom event for like around an algorithm or something that I'm working on, I'd have to make a custom event and then wrap that, right? Yes, you would have to make a you would have to make a custom event um, like this, um, yeah. so, and then you would have to wrap whatever function that you want in a begin and a commit. Okay. Okay. Fair so enough. it here is the here's the one for um, here's the one for the um, which is the um, the asynchronous one. Um, so so really what this is is i have a i have a static method that enables stats recording that takes the cache name and basically the cache which is a you know a map of a map of maps maybe um, and then what you do is um, you come down here and you add a periodic event to flight recorder and pass the run in so it's a little more complicated but uh, this is the cache name you can pass all kinds of other stats in um, so it and you notice they do a begin and a commit. Uh, what you're going to find is that the timings on this don't matter as much because it's more of a, this is what the cache size is versus this is how long the method took to execute. Uh, visual VM, um, I will, uh, uh, Visual VM yeah, does. Uh, Jay, one question. So if, sure. if you don't have flight recorder turned on, what happens with those events? Or what do they do? Uh, nothing. It does nothing. No, nope. if you don't have flight recorder turned on, uh, it's it's essentially a no op. Obviously, you're going to um, you know you're going to have the method call, but it, since flight recorder is not turned on, it doesn't emit the event, and there's no subscribers to the, those events. Okay, cool, perfect. Um, okay. So, um, anybody hasn't seen Visual VM? Uh, this is Visual VM, and of course, it's going to start up in the wrong. Okay, this is Visual VM, and and you can do the same thing. Um, you can come down here and uh, look at. You can hit remote. I can also load. Um, if I want to go ahead, I won't do it. But uh, let me see if there's a. Oh, I have a recent one on here. So this is what it looks like. Um, overview. Here was the monitor file I/O socket I/O exceptions um, here is the um, the browser um, for all events and this is uncategorized these are the um, events that we looked at earlier um, uh, with uh, a couple other um, invocations um, you can add an annotation which is um, at category and you can add category so if you wanted to right now, here are the categories, flight recorder, Java virtual machine. Uh, these are uncategorized because I didn't categorize them. But if you add a category, like I added a label um, before, if you add a category, you'll see that underneath here. So if you get to the point where there's a lot of events and you're emitting them, you definitely want to look at categorization and making sure your, your events are nameable. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and switch over and deploy these on OpenShift. I, I, I didn't want to do anything that uh, underneath the covers. So really, all I've done is I've added the Quarkus, uh, the Quarkus OpenShift uh, plugin, which is really a wrapper for the Kubernetes plugin. Um, and what I've done is um, I added uh, this to my my project file, which I've said the build strategy is going to be Docker. Um, trust certs equals true, and I, I know I want a, a route, um, so I, I want to make sure that I have a route and that I can hit it via HTTPS because um, my browser always wants to do HTTPS now, so um, that's what these do. It exposes a route and does this. Um, I'll go ahead and um, and execute this. Well, that, that's an interesting uh, uh, line of code uh, there with the trust certs. So um, if 
Is, is there security around Flight Recorder? Um, uh, so there is security around it if you're hitting Flight Recorder through JMX. Okay. So, so you can um, there uh, if you're going to open JMX, uh, you can use uh, CERT or different credentials uh, to hit JMX. So when we, I, I basically run with uh, I, I run with knives all the time, and this is running with knives because um, I'm I basically trust everything in this in this environment. Um, but you shouldn't do that when you ever you open JMX, you should. Um, use certificates and make sure that nobody else is. You can do a lot with JMX on your on your JVM, so make sure you secure it. So, great great point out. Um, and so so why? I had a question. So so why did you choose OpenShift for this demo? Is that is it is that because it's the best Kubernetes distro? Um, so I used OpenShift because um, it's uh, it's a it's a Red Hat product. Um, <laughs> you can use uh, you can use this. For um, you can do any Kubernetes for this. This operator works underneath any Kubernetes. Cryostat is uh, is amazing. Uh, it okay. So Cryostat is changing a lot. I noticed. I gave a demo last week, and and between Monday and Wednesday, I gave two different demos, and the UI had changed like significantly, like in two days. So, <laughs> so Cryostat is really being developed uh, quickly. Um, so let me go ahead and it's a little curveball for your demo there. No, no, that's that's <laughs> fine. Uh, but basically, what I've said is I've said while this is while this is doing this, let me um, let me look. So what this is doing is this is using uh, a Docker file, and all of this comes stock with Quarkus, right? Quarkus already does this Docker file for you. Um, what I've done with this is uh, normally you have this this um, parameter which is specifies the log manager and the host. What I've done is I've also added um, management uh, JMX remote on port 9091, um, and I've also said uh, JMX remote SSL equals false <clears throat> and authenticate equals false. This is me running with knives um, again. Right. And uh, you should not ever use JMX without locking it down. Um, so this should be true and this should be true. But um, I for the demo, um, I went ahead and, uh, and just opened all the doors. Um, hopefully nobody hacks me while I'm while I'm doing the demo. All right. So um, let me flip oh, back yeah. over here. We had a quick question, um, Jay. Don't mind me. A question from Chris: Is there a way to use Flight Recorder with COTS apps um, that you do not have the source code for? Um, and similarly, is it possible to use Flight Recorder with Red Hat AMQ? Um, yes, and yes. So any Java application that you're running, um, I do have an application that. Um, that I've been playing around with. And let me see if I can file open recent. And yeah, so I've got this uh, this application called Buggy App. And, and really, I downloaded Buggy because I was looking for something that was going to kind of kill my browser. Um, I, I'm sorry, that was going to kill the the thing and and I can I can show you Buggy. Buggy is actually a really neat app, but I didn't have the source code. All I had was a war and a jar. And so I, I went ahead and put together a Docker file. Um, and, and all I did was uh, I am using the OpenJDK uh, UBI 8 from Red Hat. Um, but in the command, all you have to do um, when you're pushing this up, when you're launching the app, when you're launching the Java um, application is um, add your ports in here. And uh, authenticate equals false. And then here's the Java uh, Java jar, and here's the web app runner, um, and I'm on port 9010 for the buggy app dot war files, right? So, so yes, um, you can do this with anything that's generating a jar file. Um, all you have to do is add JMX to it. Um, what you can also do, and and I don't have it in here because I was going to run along on my demo, um, is there is a cryostat agent. Um, and the cryostat agent is a uh, it's a it's a secondary jar. Um, and the neat thing about the cryostat agent is it allows you to inject 
um, events into your code live. Um, look for that in part two. But uh, so right now, what I'm doing is I'm using the um, I'm using JMX, um, and I'll show you why here in a few minutes. Um, but but yes, um, you absolutely can use it for um, for AMQ as well. Um, and and all you have to do is when you launch your broker, um, add this to it, um, and you'll be able to get all of the stock events that are in the JDK. Um, if you wanted to add. Um, uh, if you wanted to insert stuff, you could do it with the cryostat agent if you're inside Kubernetes. Does that answer question? Yeah, that's right. pretty good. And guys, if you have follow-up questions or need some more clarification, you know, feel free to throw those in the chat. All right, so we should. <laughs> yep. So here's my here's my deployment that's hopefully finished. So uh, we, we do have another question. Um, we said, if you're not exposing the service, say if you were using the Red Hat API management, um, can you get to the JMX via port forwarding and what settings might need changing? Ah, um, you can get to it through port forwarding. Okay. Um, I am, I, I'll be honest with you, with the, with the API management, I'm not really sure. Um, I will post that back. I'll, I'll do some research and, and post that back. But yes, you can do port forwarding on this, but you do run into problems once you secure it, um, you know, because you have to forward the certificate along, right, um, if you're going to do certificates. Um, so it uh, security becomes a problem with the port forwarding. But yes, you can do it with port forwarding as long as you're running with NAS. Um, so, so here is my application. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, and and uh, take a look at it. I'm flipping over to the developer topology. Here's my application, same application, uh, but and now I'm running it inside of um, inside of OpenShift. Um, what I'm going to do, um, I'm going to flip back over, and I'm going to go ahead. I have already installed um, the Cryostat operator because it's it's really uninteresting. You go into Developer Hub. Um, you you basically click on this, and it, then you click on install, um, and uh, it just takes a little while to do it. Um, so when you go into really quickly, and just in case you're not familiar, like with Developer Hub and operators, um, just really quickly. So Developer Hub is a list of, or I'm sorry, of Operator Hub. Um, operator Hub is a list of operators we've certified that would work on top of OpenShift, right? We can come through there and search for all sorts of stuff, right? Yep. There's things like Apicurio, App Dynamics Cloud Operator, um, Aqua Security. Um, you know, there's a, you can see there's a bunch of AWS ones in here. So uh, if there's an operator out there, um, we've combed the world for it. Um, and we've uh, done some testing on it. And we've, uh, you know, worked with our partners to make a really robust operator architecture. So, so Cryostat's just one of them. Um, and here's my build of cryostat. Um, it does require me to create a cryostat server. And here's the cryostat server. Um, I'm just going to call it cryostat greeting. Um, and I'm going to take all the defaults down here. Um, and yes, there are uh, trusted TLS certificates you can add down here um, so that you can actually hit your JMX. <coughs> Uh, you can hit your JM. You can hit your um, your workloads running JMX right now. My pod. Um, I'll look at that right now. Right now, my pod, which is code with Quarkus, is running on uh, uh, port eighty. Interesting. Um, so uh, what what I really need to do is I really need to open up port ninety ninety one as well, um, so that Cryostat can see it. Cryostat will see um, anything with a named service called uh, JFR-JMX or running a port 9091. You can also add them manually, um, but Cryostat will automatically um, pick them up. Let's see where we're going. Let's see where we're at with our, <laughs> our install. And no status yet. Take, taking a while here to install, huh? It is. 
Um, let me kill it. Um, so um, what you'll also notice here, and I won't change anything. What you'll also notice is that I created a um, I, I, I created a cryostat um, inside of uh, the namespace greeting. I could create a cluster cryostat, um, and that works throughout the entire um, that works throughout the entire uh, cluster. Um, the reason I do this is because it does search through all the services, um, and uh, it's easier to have uh, people at this namespace, uh, like the greeting namespace. Like maybe you're a developer and you are um, working in this namespace. Huh. And I think it's not it's a serious time. It's not, it, we're yeah. probably, not, probably not on like a dedicated cluster either, right? It's a shared cluster, I'm sure. Right? Yeah, this is a shared cluster. Um, I, I will say, let me I tell you what, let me. Um, if anything um, goes wrong in the demo, Jay, it's OK, because um, it's just Jeremy and I rubbing off on you. So. <laughs> um, all right. So you guys do get to see me. You guys do get to see me um, create. Uh, let me uninstall the operator and and you guys do get to see me create uh, the operator again. Um, <laughs> I've not had it take that long before. Um, so, um, but uh, so what I'll do is um, I'll go, I'll come down here and I'm going to go ahead and make this uh, while we're waiting for that to install. I'm going to edit the service and I'm going to come down here and with some YAML magic, um, I'm going to um, add. A, uh, a service called JFR, JMX, uh, TCP. I'm going to add 9091. I think I had it on 9091. Uh, going to go ahead and save it, reload it. And so now I have, uh, now I've exposed port 9091. Um, let's go back over here. There you go. All right. Now this is where we were tripped up at. Um, right. Greeting namespace. Yep. It should at least start to show a status. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah. There is there is one other thing that you have to install, and I completely forgot about it. Um, uh, the Red Hat Cert Manager for OpenShift. Um, so, sorry about that. Hey, no worries. That that makes perfect sense. So let me come over here and let me delete that that instance. Um, that does make that does make sense why um, it it didn't uh, it didn't install. Okay, so now I've seen we've installed uh, Cert Manager for OpenShift, um, and we'll go back here and create Cryostat, and hopefully. Okay. Uh, at least it's, uh, it is. Yeah. All right. So still pending. It is still pending. Um, and I, you know, leading up to this, I can't believe I'm not going to be able to, 
There we go. Okay. Now it's progressing. Finally. <clears throat> All right. And then it'll come through. And when it comes through, I'm going to get a... Not yet. Main deployment processing. I knew I should have set this up before we started, but I wanted I wanted everybody to be able to see. This <laughs> see setup, right? Yeah. And um, and at least I have my service on ninety ninety one. That's already there. And you see, um, Cryostat also has its service is also set for ninety. It monitors itself. It's a Java application as well. Um, so. Uh, all right, so all of that stuff looks great. Um, and we're not there yet. And wouldn't you know, I closed my window. Okay, just to let you know, I am doing this on Arrow, um, and so uh, it's it's truly Arrow. up in the cloud. <clears throat> yeah, Arrow is Azure uh, Red Hat OpenShift. In case uh, in case you're not familiar with our internal uh, slang shorthand. All right, finally we get to Cryostat, um, right. and it's gonna it's gonna make me log in, and. Copy my super secret password on there. Is it password with the at symbol to make it, it safe? It is. Yeah. I have to allow permissions, and then Cryostat comes up. Uh, we're going to skip the tour. Okay. You'll see I have my code with Quarkus here. Um, that uh, This is my application that I've deployed. Um, and you can start to see that it's looking at CPU load, um, heat dump. Um, I don't really have any recordings for it yet. Um, if I want to go ahead and uh, if I want to go ahead and create a recording, um, I can uh, I can give it a template. Uh, say, um, let's say um, tests duration thirty. I'm going to choose the continuous, um, and I'm going to go ahead and create it. Um, archive on stop. Yep, and uh, I'll just I'll just make it continuous. So, so now what I have is I have um, this, um, this right here. It's doing live analysis. Um, you can see anything that shows up. This is what changed on me in the middle of the week. This will actually, uh, you'll see things highlight in red. Um, this is live. If I want to take a snapshot, um, I can download the recording. Um, or what I can do is I can come through and I can say I want to archive um, this um, take a snapshot of it, um, and here is the archive. Um, so uh, same information, it's just not live. Uh, this was a snapshot that was taken. Nice. And um, now do you remember to leave it, do you recommend leaving this running full-time too? Because you mentioned yeah. it's okay, no? Or yes? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I, I do recommend, recommend leaving it, it running full-time. Matter of fact, um, what I recommend doing is coming in here into automated rules and and what I like to do is these automated rules will automatically start a recording um, when you have certain pods that crank up. So I'm going to say all um, 90, 90, um, all uh, 90, 91. Pods. So I could, I could watch on Kubernetes labels and annotations in there too, right? That's and exactly right. That's exactly right. So, um, All right, so, and then I can put my description down here, and um, I'm going to go ahead and copy this from in here. So, basically, there is a, there's an annotation for cryostat port um, that's in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and paste it, and what you'll see is that uh, the one, the pods that are in here will highlight um, if they're enabled. 
So really what I did was I said, okay, fine, let me go ahead and highlight um, anything that has an annotation that has cryostat port of 9091. Um, and, uh, and I could say enabled, select the template um, continuous, um, maximum size, maximum age. I can do archival period. Uh, so you can archive every 24 hours if you want to. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and create it. Um, and what you're going to see is 9091 pods was created. Uh, and you're going to start to see that if I go into recordings, you're going to see this is my original test pod that was running. Now I have an auto pod running. Um, if I go in and really hope this works, um, if I go into um, my developer um, on this and I say I want to um, uh, increment the number of pods, um, so now I have two Java processes running, um, and I'll, I'll say three Java processes. Um, all right, so scaling to three. Um, if I come back over to finish scaling up, so now I have three Java processes running, um, and you'll see that it actually discovered those other targets. And it started a continuous running for the auto 9091 pods. This is really important because if you if you have an auto scaler, um, you need to make sure that your pods are tagged in a way that Cryostat can automatically start a continuous um, recording on. Um, there is one more thing that you can do. Um, you can view this in Grafana. Um, and uh, Grafana. I do have a, um, I have to actually get the password in order to view stuff in Grafana because Grafana comes with Cryostat. And um, what I will do is come down here. All right, and there's my admin password for Grafana. And okay, admin. On my password managers. So what you can say is this recording duration was 41 seconds. You can see the CPU spike. Um, honestly, this works so much better if you come to um if you come to like your dashboard um, and you're looking at uh, and you're looking at these, uh, let's let me go ahead and pick one of these. Um, what I can do is if I come down here to recording, if I had a longer one, I, I could view any of those recordings in Grafana. Uh, this one's running for two minutes. It's a little longer, but um, this is a live recording since it's a continuous recording um, and it will give you live stats. Um, so if this were running for a while, I'd see CPU load and physical memory and stuff running in Grafana for those Java applications. All right. I see I'm three minutes over. <laughs> no, that's perfect. Any, any, any questions? Do we have any more questions? I think that's great. What, uh, you know, so what about this at scale, Jay? Uh, so, you know, what happens when I'm now you know, I have hundreds of, of containers running and, you know, on a, on a single node, not a, let alone in my uh, cluster. Yes. Uh, so the first thing I would recommend is that, um, so when you do this, uh, so inside of OpenShift and Kubernetes, you can do a persistent volume claim. Um, and when you specify a recording, when you create a recording, you can come down here and say uh, meta, you can come down here and you can add a persistent volume claim um, when you when you snapshot your recordings. Um, and so what I would make sure you do is uh, right now, um, every pod comes with temp space. So all of this, all of these that I'm, um, if I do a download recording um, and 
and, and it downloads it here. That's local space. Um, if I say view in Grafana or if I archive something, all of these are going to be in temp space. When I down this cryostat pod, they're all going to be gone. Um, but you can um, add into, when you do the operator, you can add uh, a persistent volume claim so all of your snapshots get saved in the same place. I would definitely organize your cloud storage that way. So if you have, uh, say, 47 different pods and they've each got 10 instances that they are each moving in a different place, and this is another reason why you would install Cryostat uh, when you when you look at when you look at your operators. Uh, this is another reason why I would make sure that I install a Cryostat per each namespace because the uh, this Cryostat sample this is going to have your persistent volume claim in it, right? So. Uh, it is important that if you're, say, everything from greeting goes to one place, everything from, say, uh, your Moz app goes to a different place. So it, it's important that you set these up separately so you have a different place to store these. If you want to store them in directories, you can do that as well. So we, we talked a bunch about um, JMX and you talked a bunch about, you know, things that actually require introspection. So what about when I'm using Grail VM or Mandrill to um, native compile? Ah, that, that is, that's amazing. Yeah, so um, if, you're using, um, if you're using Mandrill is not as compatible as, as Grawl is, um, but you can, you can do it. Uh, and the way that you would do it is, um, so, Okay, so Sorry, I I just, I, you said I was amazing, so I just uh, tried to record that and call my wife in here, but no, uh, right. Uh, <laughs> so, so right here, I'm actually gonna go ahead and um, I'm gonna go ahead. This is I'm, I'm packaging this, and I'm saying I'm telling it it's native, um, and you have to pass this in here minus D. Um, uh, Quarkus native monitoring equals JFR. If you don't pass that in, you don't get native monitoring, um, but this additional build argument, the signal handler based execution sampler um, is another switch that you should pass in. Um, it changes the samplers from the simple sampler to the execution sampler. Um, but let me go ahead and kick this off. And when I go ahead and do this, um, what the way I would run it is, um, it might take a little while. Um, but um, you run it the same way when you run your native executable. Um, you do have to pass in the JFC. That's a member uh, we talked about the default or the profile configuration, and it's an XML file. You have to pass that in um, uh, by itself because there is no default um, that you end up with for Grawl. So you have to actually pass in the configuration. Hopefully this will finish here in a second. Um, and all right. So I'm actually going to show you my cheat sheet so we can talk about it while we're doing it. So really, this is my my target um, right here. And, and you know, I wish I could actually. Um, so. Yeah, you can't see that very well. Um, we're still building, um, but basically what I'm doing is I'm I'm actually running the runner, um, and I'm passing in the the XX start flight recording. And the only thing that's really different is that I had to pass under settings. I had to pass in my configuration, which is my JFC, um, and I'm using the JDK 21 J um, uh, configuration for that. Um, so. Close, not there yet. Um, so uh, still running my native compile, but so I would- while, while we're waiting for the compile, can you uh, dump any, uh, you know, where would I go to find, you know, if I wanted to pull this down and play with it right now, where would I go? Um, if you wanted to pull- Cryostat and start playing with it locally. Um, so, um, 
or uh, Java Flight Recorder. So Sorry. Cryostat uh, Cryostat IO um, is yeah. um, is the um, is the place and. Can you guys see that or can Jeremy just see that? Got it. You got it. Got it. Okay. Thanks. So, so that's cryostat.io. Um, you can pull down. So flight recorder is built into the JDK um, and it's, it's in the JDK documentation. Um, I do have, um, here are a couple good, uh, there's a couple good um, uh, links that I have out. Um, in my slide deck um, that are um, down here at the bottom somewhere. I threw them down here somewhere. Um, but yeah, Java Flight Recorder uh, built into the JDK. Ah, here's the rel doc documentation on how to use that, and it's access.redhat.com. Um, and... And so if you look at any of the JDK, um, Oracle's JDK documentation, um, look at this just happens to be Red Hat's, um, but it has all the information about Java Flight Recorder. Um, and uh, there are a ton. It's been around for a while. So there are a ton of uh, samples that are that are out there. Um, it's okay. so we mentioned earlier that it's been around since Sun. Was it around for prior to Sun? Was it earlier than Sun or did Sun had created? I mean, was it a Sun, web I mean, I mean, didn't I mean, Sun? I I don't. I think I think JDK one eight was the first time it was around. So Sun, okay. yes, yeah, before Oracle. But um, I, yeah. I definitely think it was it was around in eight. It it uh, and they've really done a lot with it since eight. So if I want to execute this natively, um, you guys can still see. Basically, I'm I'm passing in my target, which is my native executable. And I'm just passing in XX start flight recording. Here's my settings, which is my default JFC. Um, and, and so um, it is, um, it started. Uh, the problem that you run into with a native compile, you don't have JCMD. Um, you don't have access to, uh, you have to, you can either shut it down um, or you can, this is a duration of 60 seconds, or you can do this. It is not easy to get to yet. Um, Mandrel and Grawl are both putting features in um, to allow Java Flight Recorder um, to work in there. Uh, so most things do work. Um, I will say some of the things are limited. I would like a utility like JCMD to be able to dump these without having to wait for the timeout or without having to kill my application. So. Oh, and by the way, so. Uh, um... J Rock, it goes back to the J Rocket JVM from BEA. Oh, it does. It goes back to J Rocket. Okay, that's why. You're right. So this came out of J Rocket. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Uh, anything you want to close out with, Jay, that you want to parting words of wisdom? Yeah. I mean, besides yeah. the fact that we all both want Jeremy's hat because. You're yeah, right. Yeah. I'm going to go look bell, for it. This, this bell is seriously annoying. I, uh, yeah. But at well, least birds know that I'm coming. I, I should have worn that last night because I uh, I broke into the Christmas cookies already. So <laughs> my, my last parting words would say I would say, look, um, add Java Flight Recorder to all of your whether you're running in Kubernetes, whether you're running in uh, a, you know just a you know bare metal, whether you're running in um, you know vert, uh, whatever you're running in. Add this to your Java application. You never know when it's going to crash, when you're going to have problems. It's a very minimal overhead, and you can still use other tools with it. Just because you're using Java Flight Recorder doesn't mean you're not going to use other profiling tools, but this should be your stopgap for anything bad that happens. Uh, you should be able to go back to this and, and figure out at least some breadcrumb trail about why it happened. Well, thank you very much, yeah. Jay. Um, great presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Great, much. great. I learned a lot there, and uh, you know, uh, based on how our um, how we're arranged on the screen there, you're a rose between two thorns. So um, <laughs> we appreciate you coming this month, and we'd love to have you back. 
All right, great. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. All right, cool. All right, thanks, Jeremy.